Thanks, John, very much uh, for the kind welcome, and I appreciate the work that uh, CIS has done over the years to bring together such smart and thoughtful people to assess the many challenges and opportunities facing U.S. policy toward Africa, not just today, but also over the long term. Jennifer Cook and Steve Morrison also thank you for your leadership and vision in this regard. And let me also acknowledge and thank the U.S. Institute of Peace for its important commitment to study conflict prevention and long-term peace building across Africa and the world. I also want to recognize the special representative of the Secretary General, as already mentioned by Mr. Hamri, Ambassador Uld Abdallah, who uh, I understand will be speaking later today and I already had a great conversation with him this morning as well as the excellent exchange we had uh, when I was in Djibouti in December. I met with him on my trip to the region this past December and have been long impressed by his tireless work and enduring optimism that positive change in Somalia is possible. In addition, I also want to acknowledge the presence of Ambassador John Yates, the former U.S. Special Envoy for Somalia, for whom I have great respect. Finally, as I look around the room, it is apparent we have incredible expertise and experience here. There are many uh, Somalis and Somali Americans who have family and friends directly affected by the ongoing crisis in Somalia. And although John was right that when I answered that first question about Somalia in my driveway, there were no votes in Wisconsin relating to this, there are now. Uh, there are Somalis who work uh, in northwestern Wisconsin, very, very, of course, just a half hour or so from the Twin Cities. And so we are honored to have members of the Somali community living in our state and, of course, are pleased uh, to get to know them better. There are also many who have spent years working as humanitarians, diplomats, and researchers to help bring lasting peace to the Horn of Africa and Somalia specifically. So I am grateful for your continued work and honored to be with you today. As was said, I've been working on Somalia for a long time. In 1993, as a new U.S. Senator, even before I was sworn in, it was actually 92, I watched as U.S. troops in Mogadishu tried, with tragic consequences, to restore law and order. I was concerned about how poorly defined the nature of the mission was, and I did support the withdrawal of our troops. But I was also concerned that we would uh, disengage completely, uh, politically, and that that could come back to haunt us. And of course, it did. More recently in 2001 and 2002, at a series of hearings I chaired on security threats posed by weak or failed states in Africa, Somalia kept coming up again and again. I called on the Bush administration then to develop a coordinated, consistent, and long-term approach to Somalia. This never happened. Instead, all the limitations of the last administration's war on terror remained apparent. The manhunt for individual terrorists continued, but without any coherent strategy for stabilizing Somalia or eliminating its status as a terrorist safe haven. When I last spoke here in January 2007, I warned that the situation in Somalia would get much worse if we did not move quickly to develop and implement a comprehensive stabilization and reconstruction strategy. Tragically, again, this is just what happened. The situation is far worse today uh, than it was two years ago. You all know the statistics, so I don't need to repeat them. But I'll cite the words of senior UN officials, including Under Secretary for Humanitarian Affairs John Holmes, who has called it the world's worst humanitarian crisis, the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. I think we can all agree that the situation in Somalia has also become worse since 2006 in terms of security and specifically its impact on U.S. national security. While the Somali people are a moderate people, the terrorist group al-Shabaab has grown in ranks and reach. In public statements, Al-Qaeda's number two leader, Ayman al-Zawahiri, has highlighted this as a success story and repeatedly called for foreign fighters to travel to Somalia. Many of our top national security leaders, including then CIA Director Hayden and Joint Chiefs Chairman Mullen, have recently said that Al-Qaeda is trying to gain new footholds in Somalia. And at her confirmation hearing, Secretary Clinton also expressed concern that Al-Qaeda is trying to take advantage of the state failure in Somalia. So the threats to our national security continue to be very real. And we need to make sure that they are addressed in the strategy we develop. 
I am confident that President Obama and his administration are paying attention to these growing threats and the deepening crisis in Somalia, and I was pleased to learn that they are in fact now beginning a serious interagency policy review process. Now this strategy, as I have indicated, could not come at a better time. And that is in part because of the recent opportunities for increased attention and invigorated engagement. First, there was the withdrawal of the Ethiopian forces in January. When I was in Djibouti in December, we weren't sure that was going to happen, but in fact, that has transpired. Second, the election of President Sharif, the appointment of Prime Minister Sharmarki, the naming of the new cabinet, and the attempt to relocate the government back to Mogadishu are all positive steps toward an inclusive political process. Third, the region of Puntland held elections in January leading to a new administration, and Somaliland is set to hold its own elections in May. In its review process, I trust that the administration is giving careful thought to the implications of each of these factors, and I know that you will be discussing those of various factors in today's sessions. However, there is a risk that if we focus too narrowly on tactical decisions, that we will continue to operate without a larger strategy. Nothing, in my view, is more important right now than getting that strategy in place. A strategy that integrates all of our national security resources, including those of the Department of Defense and the intelligence community. The situation in Somalia is complex, and we cannot predict how events will play out, but we can ensure that our responses to those events fit within some kind of a coherent vision. We can ensure we don't confuse or continue to make the same mistakes. To that end, I want to outline what I see as um, the key considerations in developing a strategy for renewed engagement in Somalia. First, any strategy begins with clearly identifying and prioritizing our objectives, both in the short term and the long term. In Somalia, I believe that our goals fall into four categories. One, counterterrorism. Two, state building. Three, humanitarian concerns and human rights. And four, regional stability. These areas will certainly not be new to anyone in this room. But defining them up front and assessing their interrelationship is very important. The previous administration's failure to properly develop and harmonize strategic objectives resulted in conflicting agendas that often undermined one another. So let's take counterterrorism first. There are individuals and networks in Somalia that directly threaten American interests, and we need to stop them. The question, however, is whether tactical operations, like the strikes conducted by the Defense Department, underline, undermine our long-term strategic counterterrorism goals, particularly in the absence of other forms of engagement. At a Foreign Relations Committee hearing, I asked a <coughs> Defense Department official whether, in light of these strikes, we were at war in Somalia. She said no. Unfortunately, there are many Somalis who, seeing us do little else, might conclude otherwise. This combined with the association many Somalis make between the United States and the Ethiopian incursion has resulted in resentment and undermined our ability to work with the very people who could help us achieve our objectives. But let me be clear, in some cases, tactical operations against individuals and networks may be justified, especially if they have clear ties to Al-Qaeda and pose a direct threat to the United States. But we need to think more about the strategic impl implications and potential risks of these operations. We need to determine where the line lies between implacable enemies and potential partners, and then figure out ways to engage at the latter. And we need to reach out to work with and support all those Somalis whose aspirations include a country free of terrorism that plagues them even more than it threatens us. Until we do, our tactical efforts, these manhunts, will remain under a cloud of suspicion. And that is a recipe for counterterrorism that is neither sustainable nor effective. So that brings us to the second objective, state building. Establishing an inclusive, open, and functional system of governance that can enforce the rule of law and provide security is a central part of a successful counterterrorism policy over the long term. U.S. support and collaboration with regional and international partners for the new national unity government must be a central component of our strategy. We must all work together to ensure it continues to grow as a legitimate and inclusive government. Although it currently has broad appeal, this unity government does have a limited window of opportunity 
to substantially demonstrate its commitment to these ideals. Unless it makes a real difference in people's lives, in terms of security and basic services, such as protection and trash collection and job creation, this transitional government will quickly become irrelevant as have its many predecessors. I stand ready to work with the Obama administration to determine appropriate ways we can assist that process, and I stand ready to do what I can to rally Congress to authorize the necessary funds to do so. Now let me say something about peacekeeping. In the final months of the last administration, some officials pushed peacekeeping, whether the authorization of a new UN force or the strengthening of the African Union force, as the primary solution to the crisis. Now, I support peacekeeping missions in general and have called for a more robust mission in Somalia in the past. But peacekeeping is not the primary solution. And it is never a substitute for a viable peace agreement or an inclusive and functional government. At this point, I'm concerned that peacekeepers in Somalia will continue to be just another target of the current insurgency and add further fuel to the fighting. A carefully planned UN peacekeeping force may have an important role to play down the road, but there must first be a peace to keep. The UN Security Council, with our administration playing a leading role, has other areas that it must focus on immediately, and those relate to the third objective, humanitarian response and human rights. There have been substantial efforts to scale up the humanitarian response to Somalia, but those efforts have been impeded by the increasing killings and abductions of aid workers. This is unacceptable. The international community should make that clear and take steps in tandem with the government and civil society to restore the integrity of humanitarian space. At the same time, any effective strategy towards Somalia needs to incorporate accountability. Our State Department Human Rights Report notes that the country's poor human rights situation deteriorated even further during uh, 2008. Addressing the problem of impunity is not easy in the midst of state collapse, but it is nonetheless essential. We should work closely with other members of the UN Security Council in consultation with the Secretary General to consider ways to better investigate, publicize, and sanction those who orchestrate uh, human rights violations. This effort should also apply to those who fund and arm uh, violators. This leads into the <coughs> fourth and final objective, regional, regional stability. I think we can all agree that the crisis in Somalia is driven not only by internal factors, but also, of course, by external ones. It's impossible to separate the situation in Somalia from wider regional tensions, especially the historic tensions between Ethiopia and Eritrea, and the instability in Yemen, to name but a few. Renewed engagement in Somalia requires renewed engagement with the wider region. And this has been missing over recent years. And it's an essential component of any effective strategy towards Somalia. And is why I believe we need a senior level envoy for the Horn of Africa, not just Somalia. We need someone who can drive a more comprehensive approach to the region and partner with key regional bodies, including EGAD and the Arab League. This diplomat needs to have full-time staff and resources, but also work closely with our ambassadors and embassies in the region. What I said in 2007 remains true today. Strengthening our diplomatic and intelligence capacities is essential if we are to effectively pursue strategic objectives in Somalia. However, that said, I want to add a caveat to that statement now. All of our best diplomatic efforts will fail if we do not deal directly with the mistrust of U.S. intentions that has developed among Somalis over the last two years. This mistrust undermines our ability to engage constructively with different parties, and it is easily manipulated by al-Shabaab. I believe the Obama administration has a unique opportunity in the early months of the administration to change this perception. And to that end, I recently sent a letter to President Obama urging him to make a public statement that he intends to make a clear break from past policies towards Somalia. I'm convinced that doing so could make a tremendous impression on ordinary Somalis and open doors for renewed U.S. engagement in Somalia. In per perhaps no other place in the world is there a greater need and opportunity for high-level public diplomacy. Achieving stability and restoring the rule of law in Somalia will not be easy or quick. 18 years of dysfunction have proven that, but I am optimistic 
as a result of both new political dynamics in Somalia and new leadership in the White House, that we have a unique opportunity to take critical steps in that direction right now. I think no one will dispute that allowing the status quo to persist or al-Shabaab to expand is unacceptable. The question is whether we will respond haphazardly, as we have in the past, or strategically, with an understanding of what we know and what we don't, what we control and what we can't. I've offered some thoughts for how we can do the latter, but they are, of course, uh, by no means exhaustive. They could not be more timely that CIA, CSIS has brought you all together today. I urge you to think big and boldly in assessing both the lessons of the past and the opportunities uh, for renewed engagement in the future. When I was here last, it was as the incoming chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on Africa. At that time, I committed to make an aggressive effort in my capacity to bring real peace and stability in Somalia. I renew that commitment to you today and ask you to do the same. As we've learned in Afghanistan, we cannot ignore the conditions that breed and empower terrorist organizations, and we cannot address them on the cheap. Our national security, the fate of Somalia's people, and the region's stability demand nothing less. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you very much, Senator Feingold, uh, for being here today on what I know is a very busy day for you, uh, for your enduring commitment on Somalia, uh, even when it's not being in the headlines in the, in the U.S. press, uh, and uh, for the challenge I think that you put before us today. And I hope during the course of the day we can kind of uh, delve down into some of those strategies that you lay out uh, and talk about what that might look like uh, in being implemented. The Senator has agreed to take some questions. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to urge people to keep their questions very brief. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for that. Uh, so perhaps we'll take a couple at a time, or what? what uh, Tony Carroll. Thank you, Senator, and thank you for your remarks. A mic is coming. And Tony if you Carroll, Manchester Trade. I've got a mic. Thank you. Um, Senator, no country in the world depends more on the remittances of its people abroad than Somalia. Yet in this country, remittances to Somalia are greatly endangered by failure to reform banking law, which very much restricts money transfers. Last year, there was a Money Services Act of 2007 that passed through the House, but didn't get sponsorship on the Senate. There's efforts again. Senator Falk, uh, Congressman Bach has Congresswoman uh, Maloney have indicated uh, their interest in re reintroducing this legislation, yet the Senate seems to lack uh, a sponsor in this regard. Uh, have you taken an interest or would support such uh, a legislation? I've not had a chance to look at this issue, but I will immediately. Uh, when I was in Djibouti, I had an excellent meeting with a, a group of, uh, of Somali business people who, uh, of course, uh, articulated the connection between the United States and, and the communities here and there. And, I, of course, we have to deal with any difficulties or, or dangers concerning this. But this is an important part of the future of our relationship, and I will immediately take a look at that. And let's get back to him as well. Do you want me to call him, people? Sure. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm from Kenya. Um, Senator, I'm so grateful to see you here. And I know through your leadership, I have known Somali since I was a young girl. And Somali are the hardest working people in Africa. They are and they are business people. Uh, what I would like to say is uh, protect have a policy on women, children, uh, the sufferers, children, women, and young people to get out of crime, to go to school and get businesses. So, please, I know you're going to do this, and I know Somali from this day, we have to go to Somali and bring peace to Somali, not only here. So, thank you so much coming and extend my thanks and greetings to President Obama and tell them to protect Somali and the rest of Africa. Thank you so much. I appreciate your comment. The fact that you are Kenyan, you know, highlights the regional nature of this. The presence of Somali refugees in Kenya, the effect that uh, sometimes these raids that the United States has been involved in has on the attitudes of people in Kenya, particularly Muslims and in particular Somalis in Kenya. This is all interconnected and puts a pressure on the entire region. And I appreciate your expression of concern for the future of Somalia itself, but the fact is it affects the entire region if we do not um, um, uh, do a good job on this. 
Yourself. My name is Abdi Samata. I'm actually an old Wisconsinite. Where did you before you came? I came to La Crosse and I know a family friends of yours by, uh, in La Crosse. And then there were few votes before 1999. All right, well, <laughs> I, I hope I did well with them. <laughs> you certainly had mine. <laughs> I have uh, two very quick questions. One is, uh, the gentleman here talked about remittance and uh, money that belonged to uh, one of the transfer or money transfers who were inbounded uh, shortly after 9-11. Uh, and that money, although the Treasury has demonstrated that there were no criminality involved in this company, al it was called, that money is still being held, and I'm wondering what's going to happen to that, because it's ordinary people's money. That's the first one. The second one is, you now everybody talks about tired old ideas of the old regime, so to speak, here in the United States. I hope in your attempt to help Somalis and help our country, uh, that old ideas about explanations of what the problem in Somalia are not sustained anymore, because they have not delivered, and they will not deliver. Thank you very much. Well, of course, I'll just agree with the, with the second point. And, you know, as to financial transactions, you know, let, let's first all concede that we have a legitimate right as a country to investigate financial transactions that we think they're going to lead to uh, promotion or financing of terrorists. And I'll continue to believe that. But that doesn't mean laws have to be foolishly written or, or are inappropriately or excessively enforced. And so I cannot answer specifically about that money, but we will try to get back to you. And I recognize this has been a problem within a lot of places in the world, but Somalia is one of them. Somebody's straight. Oh, I'll let you. I'll let you. Yeah. Uh, Ambassador Abdallah, I think. Uh, yeah. it, it, just. Uh, and then that That's fine. Fine. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Senator. Thank you for uh, your visit in December. Uh, in uh, half a day, you, you met many people and, and left an impact. Um, I, I fully endorse what you, you have been saying. Uh, I'm very happy to have been working with career diplomat, American career diplomat, who are patient, who know for files, who don't get, you know, mismanaged or misled by uh, uh, some of our Somali friends. What I see now as uh, really an urgent matter is that Somalia is a threat, has been a threat to its people, threat to the region, a threat to a country like yours with the development of tourists. What happened in Hargeza, it was the first American-born Somali who blew up himself. We cannot neglect that. We have a legal and legitimate government. To me, the, the priority, how to support this government to help it deliver. If we try to overload them before strengthening them, we, remain, we go back to square zero, where every exercise is destroyed by a second exercise and another exercise. Somali, some of them likes it, experts like it. Uh, I think time has come. We have a legitimate government, a legal government. How to help him deliver? Thank you. Now let me take the ambassador's remarks here and just illustrate it with the, the experience I had with meeting with Sheikh Sharif. You know, for years, the Islamic courts were characterized in a way that may have had some validity. But we were essentially led to believe by the political rhetoric in this country that this was an arm of al-Qaeda, the Islamic courts in general. Now, I'm sure there were people in the Islamic courts that are people I'd never want to deal with and, and may, in fact, people that, be, that are, are our enemies. But there were other people. And one example is Sheikh Sharif. And I sat down and I met with him at, in, in the ambassador's residence in Djibouti, and I met a very diplomatic uh, person who appeared uh, devoted uh, to his country. Now, I'm not going to vouch for him for the future. Maybe he'll turn out to be somebody that we don't like. Maybe he'll turn out to be somebody that had a different agenda, but he didn't appear to be that way. And yet he was somebody that probably would have been categorized in an extremely negative way to the point where it would have been questionable for anybody like me to even meet with him a few years ago. Well, he's now the president. And the ambassador is identifying him as a leader of a government for which there is, there is hope. That is an important lesson for America as we deal with issues around the world, and particularly in Islamic countries. Somalia does not have an extremist tradition in terms of religion. It has a very moderate tradition. And that is something that we Americans need to know before we start making assumptions about a place or about the people that we might deal with. This gentleman straight back here will be the last one.
sir. Uh, Rudy Schneider, the time is uh, an associate. So I just want to thank you for your leadership on these issues. Uh, it's been quite uh, important. When you were here last, in 2007 at CSIS, you called for the creation of an international trust fund for Somalia, which I thought was a very good idea. Um, principally to get the resources in place up front to pr provide an uh, incentive. Benchmarks would obviously lead to the release of the funds. Is this something that you still think is a good idea? I, and I do. Go and I am hoping that as a part of the Obama administration's review of this, that this is something that they can take a position on uh, and, and urge uh, as a part of their review. But I, I do not want to uh, get ahead of, of what they're going to come up with on that. But it is something I still think we ought to do. Thank you very much, and I wish you well with your uh, proceedings today.